Good afternoon and welcome uh, to the April Parks and Recreation Committee hearing. I am Barry Grudenchik. I have the honor of chairing the committee for this council term. Um, I'm just going to have some opening remarks and then we will hear from First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh and Matt Jury. Um, over 30,000 acres of parkland are part of a vital infrastructure that makes New York City function. When you think about the benefits of parks, you might think about the various recreational opportunities they offer to all of our residents, from, park, from playgrounds for our children to recreation centers to athletic fields and courts to marinas to concert and event venues as well as beaches and pools and of course my favorite golf courses. Today's hearing will deal with the athletic features of our park system and focus on the Department of Re Parks and Recreation's process for issuing permits for the use of its athletic fields and courts. DPR currently has over 800 athletic fields, 1,800 basketball courts, and 550 tennis courts throughout the city and requires permits for any type of organized league activities on those fields and courts. Most recently, in 2017, DPR issued 8,100 athletic permits, which re represented 261,000 hours of permitted adult time and 616,000 hours of permitted youth time. Parks recently revamped the process to more fairly allocate ball fields and courts for a wide range of applicants by creating a process that would prioritize different categories of permit applications with youth and school leagues having first access followed by adult athletic organizations and then by non-affiliated individuals who apply to use a field for a specified season or reason. This updated process was in response to concerns by many that league participants, administrators, and regular park goers that, uh, that the way that the permits were processed created an inefficient way of allocating fields for league use and was ripe for abuse. Some have alleged that various organizations and individuals who were issued permits have often hoarded them without actually using the field for which they were issued the permit. This resulted in park users being confused regarding what areas of a park they could use for sports activities and when they may become available. Others have even alleged that various permit holders have sold or scalped their permits to those who wish to use a field at a given time, thereby trying to profit for themselves from a service that should be of minimal cost to most park goers and of course free for our children. This hearing will examine whether the current practices that DPR has implemented have in fact led to a better and more equitable permitting process and whether the abuses that have been alleged for years in some cases have been successfully curbed by the department. Those allegations are very alarming to me, they're alarming to the council, so I want to make sure that DPR is proactive in addressing them by enforcing the rules keeping tabs on bad actors and making the entire permitting process more transparent so all New Yorkers have a better understanding of how they can make the best use of other ball fields and courts. Uh, let me again start by welcoming the administration, our friends at parks, park advocates, park users, and anyone else who has come to take part in this hearing. I thank you for being here today. I want to welcome, uh, before we begin, my colleague Peter Koo, who represents uh, Queens County, specifically Flushing and the surrounding areas. And I'm now going to ask the committee council to swear in our first two um, testifiers. Testifiers, I don't know if that's the right word, but we'll go work. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? Yes. We are honored to have with us the first deputy commissioner of parks. This is your life's goal, right? This is the whole, how many years have you been there, Deputy Commissioner? Over 35. Over 35, that's an honest answer, okay. Um, yes. So we welcome your testimony and please begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Grudenchik and members of the Parks and Recreation Committee. I am Liam Kavanaugh, First Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. And thank you for inviting me to testify today regarding the Parks Department's athletic field permit process. At uh, New York City Parks, our mission is to offer resilient and sustainable parks, public spaces, and recreational amenities for present and future generations. Making our athletic facilities available to the public is a significant way in which we fulfill that mission, as is the care and maintenance of those facilities. We are the steward of over 1,000 athletic fields and over on, uh, close to 5,000 athletic courts. Uh, the agency issues approximately 8,300 athletic field permits annually. Uh, which represents just over 900,000 hours of playing time. 
It is our agency's responsibility to provide athletic permits to hundreds of schools, youth leagues, and adult recreation leagues throughout New York City uh, for the use of the fields all over the city. Our athletic field permit holders are as vast and varied as the population of New York itself, approximately 1,000 youth leagues, 400 schools enrolled in the Public School Athletic League, and an additional 400 schools affiliated with leagues other than the PSAL, and 600 adult leagues, all hosting games and practices of a wide variety of competitive sports. Uh, we are proud uh, to, sh to share that the agency has made significant strides in recent years, making our athletic field permitting process less cumbersome, more transparent, and more equitable for our users. Our initial efforts uh, were in the form of technological improvements to the underlying framework of our permit system. In 2012, we worked closely with the Mayor's Office of Citywide Event Coordination and Management and the New York City Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications in an effort to transition from a permitting system largely based on paper to a web-based web permitting system. Uh, along with a coordinated outreach effort to our permit holders, we conducted a comprehensive endeavor to map and compile attribute data for every single field and court under our jurisdiction. The creation of this geospatial map data set served as the basis for our online permitting system, which became known as the Citywide Event Management System, or SEMS. While SEMS is a citywide permitting system that serves many of our agency partners, we worked diligently to ensure that our online permit system was customized to meet the specific needs expressed by our users. We are the only city agency, as far as we know, that uses SEMS while maintaining internal control of the public-facing application process. Our digital media team at Parks serves as the steward of our public-facing application system, which allows us to easily respond to changes in the system's content and layout helping us to be more responsive to our permit holders. Since 2014, we have been fully utilizing SEMS for all special event and athletic park permits issued to the public. In conjunction with our move to a, permit, to a new permit system, we updated our athletic permit rules and regulations to better reflect our mission of transparency and equity. We conducted listening sessions in all five boroughs and held a public hearing before adopting new rules in 2012. Consistent with our mission to provide free and accessible opportunity for youth activities, our rules codified a long-standing practice of prioritizing youth league permit requests over requests submitted by adult leagues and given priority to applicants who have, been, who have held a given permit in the previous season. Through our current permit distribution process, we grant priority for field permits first to youth leagues, followed by other school leagues such as the PSAL, and then returning applicants, including adult leagues. And then lastly, all who apply within the optimal season request period. Further, we established a winter permit season for asphalt and synthetic turf fields, created a permit for teams to conduct practice sessions in addition to competitive games, and responded to the demand for year-round sports by creating out-of-season permits. Our revised rules and permit priority guidelines established well-defined application periods and expanded seasonal play to accommodate growing demand. For context, in 2017, we received close to 11,000 permit requests, 76% of which we were able to accommodate. New York City Parks makes every effort to fairly accommodate as many requests for fields and courts as possible for each season. To give you a sense of demand for athletic fields displayed here are some overview maps that outline some of those trends. As you can see, well, maybe you can't see as well as we thought. Uh, as, you can, as you can see, we receive thousands of permit requests, many of them for the same fields and times, and we make every attempt to distribute permits equitably. We do this in close coordination with our Parks Enforcement Patrol to ensure that permit rules are being followed confirm that groups are using their permitting time appropriately, and minimize instances of permit time going unused. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as uh, easy to read as, as, as we hoped it would be. It does show uh, demand, and those fields that are in red or orange uh, indicate places where we had more demand than we were able to accommodate, uh, and those that are in green uh, basically show fields where we were able to accommodate the vast majority of requests we received. 
Uh, it varies, you know, pretty pretty significantly by neighborhood. Clearly, there are fields throughout the city that are more in demand uh, and where it is almost impossible to meet all the requests that we receive. It also indicates that there are fields in each borough uh, where uh, we are able to meet the demand and in many cases accommodate even more demand than what we've received. The problems obviously are obvious. It's travel, it's the amount of time it takes to get there, uh, it's access by public transportation and things like that. Uh, but there are fields out there, even today, uh, where you could re request and receive a permit to play this season. Here's our chance. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. And, and we will provide these maps to the, to the council. I would appreciate so that. You'll be able to yes. look at them uh, in more detail, and, and certainly we're happy to follow up with any questions you may have about the, the information that we're presenting. Uh, in an effort to be uh, more, tra more transparent and provide more access to our fields, we continue to be proactive in our efforts to continually improve the permit process. We work closely with our digital media staff to respond to feedback we receive from our users regarding new and creative ways to improve user experience through the online application system. For example, our website, uh, on our website, we provide updated athletic facility usage reports that the public can access to determine what fields are currently permitted and what fields may be available. It's clear to us that New Yorkers are passionate about living active, healthy lives. From soccer in the Bronx, flag football in Brooklyn, roller hockey in Manhattan, cricket in Queens, and youth baseball on Staten Island, our ball fields are put to use every single day in every corner of the city. Uh, simply put, the demand for our fields can often outweigh the supply that we can offer but we make every effort to accommodate as many requests as possible. Uh, we're proud of the steps our agency has taken uh, to make the permitting process for athletic fields more accessible, transparent, and equitable. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today and for all your continued advocacy on behalf of New York City Parks. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we've been joined by my colleague, Francisco Moyo, also of Queens. Um, so let me begin with some questions, and then uh, these two gentlemen, either of them have questions, we'll go to them as well, anybody else who may uh, show up. Um, does Parks track complaints uh, made against permit holders for violations of permit conditions or other park rules, and how does that happen, if it does happen? Yes, on the uh, permit itself, we advise permittees to call 311 if they see any abuse of the field time or if fields are not being used. Uh, we take those very seriously. Uh, we go and investigate if there are repeated infractions or failure to use the field. Uh, we can and do take you action. Said, you said permittees. Do you mean they, they would be, they wouldn't report themselves? I was a little, maybe I'm a little confused there. No, no, but uh, typically uh, other permit holders are most interested yes, they uh, are. In, in, you know, available time, particularly where they already have established play for their leagues. And if they see fields not being used or being improperly used, uh, they are not shy about notifying us. And we tell them right on their permit to call 311 if they see uh, anything being used improperly. Uh, we do follow up. We investigate the, the circumstances for any failure to use a field or improper use. Um, we will you know, contact the league that holds the permit uh, to find out if there are any extenuating circumstances involved. And if there is repeated failure to either adhere to the permit requirements or to use the field, we will revoke the permit and take time back from the permittee. How many times would it take for me not to show up before my permit got yanked? Typically, we, we try to have three times before we three revoke strikes a and permit. You're out. Three strikes and you're out, exactly. And, and our, our rules do allow a permit holder to appeal to our general counsel uh, after we issue a revocation. But and just for example, uh, does in, it happen often? It, in, in 2017 alone, we reclaimed uh, 11,000 hours of permit time from, from our holders. So uh, it's not huge, but it is significant. It's a lot. It's a lot. I, it, it's based on what I have here. It's, it's about 1%. Yeah. Something like that. Do you do spot checking? Does, does the recreation? I, I, if I want a permit, I apply to recreation. Um, do they do spot checking, or does you have your PEP officers? Uh, we, the PEP officers do spot check permits and other requirements of, the, of, of use of our fields. 
Uh, the borough permit offices often go out and check themselves. They have relationships with many of the leagues and they like to maintain those relationships and sort of see them in action. And our park supervisors uh, during their normal inspections can also, they have all of the permit holders that are assigned to a park or a group of fields and they are, they do uh, periodically go out and check to make sure that the permits are being uh, properly used. And um, your fee structure, can you explain that a little, talk about that a little for, let's take two sports, let's take soccer and let's take um, baseball. So, okay. okay, there are, as, as you know, there are no fees for youth sports, okay. uh, regardless of the field okay. uh, or the sport that they play. Uh, our, fir our permits charges, I'm sorry, uh, uh, it is $25 per hour for a lighted ball field. It is $16 per hour for cricket, football, lacrosse, rugby, soccer, and ultimate frisbee. They typically are played on larger fields. Uh, and it's $12.50 for baseball, softball, uh, volleyball, and other uh, turf soft surface sports. That's a pretty good bargain then. So we're, we're it's basically just paying for the administrative fee, which is fine. I mean, we spend a lot of money on parks. I wish we spent more, but as I'm sure you do, but um, it's essentially an administrative fee, which is what it's supposed yes. to be. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, we asked that question. What happens if I got bounced last year and I try to come back? Is there a, you go to the back of the list, how does that work? Uh, you would not be able to uh, reclaim the time as a returning permit holder. Uh, you could apply, and uh, if there is time available at a, at a field that you are interested in playing, you could be granted that time. Okay. All right. Um, in the interest of promoting democracy, I am going to call upon uh, my colleagues at this time, and uh, Mr. Ku, I believe you were here first, so yeah. if you're ready. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mr. We won't put a clock on you since there's only two of you. So. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming. Um, so uh, my question is, like, um, the groups currently have priority uh, if they had the permit in the past, right? Yes. What about the new groups applying for the permit? So how you set up the criteria? Like in the past, we have some like Korean senior soccer groups. They reach out to our office and uh, about applying for permits, but they were always denied you know, the to us. You know. So how do you get into the system? You know? Well, we make every effort to accommodate as many applicants as possible. Uh, and while we may not be able to offer playing time at a preferred location, we can often uh, direct applicants to other fields that allow that same sport to be played. But our rules specifically allow us to consider, among the decision-making factors, when we issue a permit, accommodating new uh, and new leagues. Uh, and we often do that by working with established leagues uh, to find some time on fields that are most popular. And oftentimes, leagues are willing to work with us because uh, they remember when they were getting started and trying to establish themselves, and they often had to uh, had to rely on other groups being willing to share time with them in order to get established. So uh, it is a factor that we consider in granting permits, both for youth and for adults. Uh, we do. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, um, you know, understate the fact that we do, uh, you know, favor returning applicants. But it's one of the factors we consider, and one of them we take very seriously in trying to <coughs> make more fields available to new applicants. Location is really important. Uh, some groups, they want to play in a particular field because they are all, they are, no, they, it's not easy for them to go to other fields you know, that is available. And, and uh, how do you prevent people like having a permit? Actually, they are not using it. They let other people use it. I mean, how do you identify this group? By social security numbers or they have a tax ID? Or, or what, what is the, the way you can identify the pie, the group of pies that actually the group who's paying on the field? Well, we, we issue a permit yeah. uh, to, all, to the leagues and all of the teams that are playing in the league, and they have to have the permit with them uh, when they're playing, and it does identify the actual teams that are supposed to be using the field. Uh, so if it is not a member 
a team that is enrolled in that league, um, that is certainly one way in which we would know that, uh, that something wrong has happened. And we would take further investigative steps to determine why the team or the league that was issued the permit was not using the field. But, but how do you identify? You go to a team leader or a captain or what? I mean, who, who, who is supposed to be uh, in charge on, on that particular team? Anyone who, who ever, every team that's using a field, that a permitted field, is supposed to have the permit present with them yeah. while they're playing. And we may not know which individual has the permit when we approach them, uh, but most leagues know they have to produce the permit, and they do produce it when we ask them. If they don't, then we would take steps to make sure that the permitted team is on the field, and if they, and if it's not, then we would take action against the league that is supposed to be using the field. So you, when you check, you only check whether they have the permit. Yes. So if I suppose I apply and I get a permit, I, I, I let other people to go. Hey, take my permit. You go play on the field. You know. So how do you prevent that? That would be very difficult for us to, uh, to determine. If they have a valid permit uh, for use of the field and the time that's stated on the permit, uh, it's, it would be almost impossible for us to determine whether every single player was enrolled and affiliated with a league. Um, it would be, it would be a, a massive administrative burden to try to go to that level of detail. So may, may I suggest that you have a, like, a team leader's name? Now, this guy must be present at the field. Like if you own a restaurant, you know, the, the, the whoever uh, cook in the kitchen, they have a permit. You know, if not yes. there, you get fined. I, I, I understand the analogy, council yeah. member, but there are a thousand fields and there are 40 hours a week that a, f a team could be using. It, it would be, I think it would, might be unreasonable to expect a league to have one or two persons present at every field at every time. No, yeah. every field. I mean, that, that particular field. So you assign that field to play, then you, you have to be there. You cannot give it to other people, other teams to play. Uh, again, there are so many league teams involved in these leagues. Mm. I, I think it would be difficult to insist that one official representative from a league be present at every game. Well, I hope you can try. You know, so, I mean, the, the biggest... Uh, 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 I cannot prove it, but I know I heard from people that they abuse uh, in the system. Uh, people, they, they have the permits, uh, they, 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 they lend the permit to other people to play, but they actually, they're not the, the way play. Council member, we don't want people to abuse their permits mm -hmm. either. Uh, if you hear from your constituents that that is occurring, please let us know. We will be happy to follow up and do whatever we can to determine if the right permit holder is on the field at the time and requested. Okay. I just, yeah, want, to, I just want to follow up on Councilman Ku's uh, question. Have you had instances in the last year or two or three that where whatever you want to call it, scalping or black market operations of permits? You know, we've, we've all heard the anecdotes um, and one of the reasons we called this hearing today was to find out a little bit about that and, and what Parks is doing to prevent that. I know it's, it is a big system and People will always try to take advantage, some people, but I just wanted to know if you've had recent experience with that and what has happened. We have fully revoked uh, 18 permits over the last two years uh, for abuses, some of which are similar to what you described. Uh, we do follow up on cases where, uh, where people allege that permits have been sold because that is clearly uh, a, you know, a, a, an extreme violation of our permits. Uh, and our rules and regulations. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to be able to prove that money has changed hands, um, you know, for a permit. Uh, I think we did, we were able to establish that clearly in a couple of cases and revoked the, uh, the permits and actually referred cases to the Department of Investigation in those instances. Uh, but uh, it, it can be a difficult uh, thing to prove. Council Member, do you have any more questions? Well, I have one more question. Okay. Okay. And um, for the permit application uh, process, uh, how long it takes? Uh, uh, some people told me it takes a while, you know. 
Well, you had to apply the three months uh, ahead? Or well, we, we have an, an application period that we established in order, primarily so that established leagues can, uh, can submit their requests for the following season in a time frame that allows them to uh, prepare for the coming season. Uh, many leagues don't know exactly how many teams will be participating, how many players will be in the league. Uh, they like to have some time in which to assemble all that information before they submit their applications. So we give a roughly a, a two-month period in which returning applicants uh, can submit their application um, and uh, you know, we find that it works well for them. It gives them enough time to plan and prepare, uh, and it gives our staff enough time to process the permit applications uh, in advance of the actual playing season. But you can apply for a permit today. Uh, if a field is available in the next couple of days, we'll be happy to grant you a permit. I see, okay. But there are you know, sort of peak demand periods, certainly at the start of the spring, uh, at the start of the fall season, where everyone wants to get their permit at the same time, uh, and it does take a little bit longer during those periods in order to process all the requests and issue the permits. So one moment is, how do you reach out to the pet officers? Because you, we usually don't see them on the fields or in the park. Very rarely I see one, you know. So pet if officer? I have some, some important thing happening, I want to call a pet officer. You call to your line? Yes. And uh, they, they connect directly to our central dispatch, and we would uh, send an officer. If an officer is available, they're not always uh, available, but we would send an officer to the, to the situation. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councilman Koo. I just want to let everyone know we've been joined by uh, Councilman Jimmy Van Bramer, also from Queens. This is a, uh, we have a Queens infield today. Um, at this time, um, Councilman Moya has some questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for um, calling this uh, hearing, this very important hearing. Uh, thank you to the Deputy Commissioner um, for being here. Um, again, I, I have uh, a district uh, that encompasses uh, Flushing Meadows Corona Park and uh, a large area where we've seen uh, a lot of this uh, abuse that has been going on. Um, for me, the, the question is, um, do you have a public database that people can search um, to see when the field is open and what group has it booked at uh, particular times? Uh, yes, we uh, produce reports that we post on our website that allows anybody to uh, see what fields are open and available and what fields are permitted to determine whether or not the permit holder is actually using the field um, as permitted. And. Does your department prioritize fields and courts requested uh, requests that are made by returning customers? And do you have a sense of how many of them may be um, reselling their permits? Uh, we prioritize first by youth sports uh, and then adults. And within both youth and adults, we prioritize by returning customers. Uh, we, if we had any knowledge of any either youth or adult selling permits, uh, we would take action. And I, I'm not aware of anyone that is selling permits. So I say this because um, a New York Post article that was published last June um, that talked about the Queens Little League uh, and its president that was charging $400 uh, in cash to use uh, the Park of the Americas in Corona, Queens uh, for children's leagues. Um, and that field should have been free. Are you aware of that story? Yes, I'm aware of the story. So. I'm going with this because we've also done uh, some events in the park mm -hmm. um, where we had brought in a um, soccer player uh, who was gonna do a free clinic to about uh, four or five public schools in the area. Uh, we worked with um, your department um, to ensure that whichever groups uh, that were there that had the permits for those fields, uh, we made personal phone calls to incorporate them uh, in part of this soccer clinic. Um, and when we made those calls, and I think we spoke about this to some of your folks here, those folks weren't even, didn't even have a team. Um, they weren't even utilizing the field. Uh, and it raised some red flags to us, given that these are 
uh, fields that are so desperately needed by so many different um, youth leagues that want to use these fields. And then we had four um, uh, groups that were not even utilizing those fields. Now you said it's three strikes and you're out. Is this a matter of enforcement? Is this a matter of not having enough in the department to actually go out there and look and investigate that this is a prevailing problem within our community? Uh, we, we are not in a position to, uh, to oversee every game at every field. I'm not talking about every game. I know. I'm talking about specific groups that actually have permits for specific times in a park that is heavily utilized. We know that there's nine soccer fields, I think, in Flushing Meadows Corona Park, or roughly nine to 11, right, based on what the use is. Is there any way of having spot checks to see if they are actually being utilized by the permit holders? Yes, we do spot checks through park enforcement, through the district supervision, and through our permit staff. So can you walk me through that process? What, kind, what is the spot check? Is it once a month? Is it random? Like, what are, what are those? I, I couldn't say exactly how frequently it occurs. Uh, obviously, it, we, we tend to concentrate at the start of the season, uh, both spring and fall, uh, when we have just issued new permits. Uh, and we, we ask both our supervisors, and we give, of course, the list of all the permit holders, uh, and we ask them to periodically visit the fields, particularly during high use periods, and that's three to seven on weekdays, eight to six on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, to visit, check to make sure the, the permit holder uh, is present, they have their permit, and they are using the field properly. Uh, I can't tell you how frequently it happens, but it is something that happens So that, that that's my concern, is that there is not su su sufficient spot checks here. And what we're seeing now more than ever is that as the increase for uh, groups that want to come in and use these, these bowl fields, um, they are now forced to rent out and pay money to permit holders to utilize these fields, whether it's for the weekend or whether it's for a tournament. And I'm trying to get to the how we can solve this problem and whether that's through more enforcement, uh, a better management of how we know that in Flushing Meadows Corona Park in particular, we have 11 ball fields. How can we better manage that process? Um, and how can you let me know how that process is being handled? Council Member, if there are specific fields in Parks of the America you mentioned is one and uh, Flushing Meadow I imagine is another. If there are particular fields that you are concerned about, uh, we can certainly focus more of our oversight attention on those fields. One, to ensure that the proper permit holder is using it, and two, to communicate to uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the ball field community that we are being more attentive to those fields. We are absolutely happy to do that. But if anyone is approached uh, about purchasing a permit, they should let us know immediately. Uh, we will take uh, the strongest possible action we can to determine whether sales are happening, and if they are, uh, we will, one, of course, revoke the permit uh, and take any legal steps that we can against someone who is doing that. Great, and I encourage you to please stay or have your staff stay, because we do have someone uh, from the neighborhood who's actually going to testify to that. Um, and I think that that's something that um, I would love to continue to work with, with, with you and, 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 and staff on this, because um, this is something that is a growing problem in, in not just my community, but I think you've heard some of the members here in Queens who have um, seen this happening and the complaints continue to grow. Uh, we wanna make sure that, uh, especially if there's uh, children's leagues that um, are abusing that, that, that uh, permit, that we are taking uh, swift and severe action to revoke uh, their permits uh, and making sure that that uh, does not continue to happen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Bramer. Thank you. We've been joined by, as well, uh, from the Great Borough of the Bronx, land of my birth, Mark Joni. Do you have any questions, Councilman? Uh, I do. Okay. Put him on a 30-second clock. 
but yeah, the borough of the Bronx uses a different type of a okay. clock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to know. Go ahead. What, who oversees the spot checks? Is it PEP officers? Uh, it is usually the borough management. They work with the PEP, they work with the supervisors, and they work with the permit staff to oversee the spot checks. What is the number of borough managers that we have? Uh, in the Bronx? Um, citywide. Oh, this citywide, uh, approximately 60. 60. So 60 managers to oversee 1,000 athletic fields, 4,000 athletic courts, roughly 8,300 athletic field permits, which represents over 900,000 hours of playing time. It's not just the managers who do this. There are approximately 250 supervisors who may um, be assigned to this function. There are approximately 250 PEP officers who may also be assigned to this function. So it's not simply the managers who are responsible for conducting the spot checks. Right, but the, so give me an idea, or give us all an idea. Explain to us the, the spot checks uh, by department, by title. Uh, we produce a, a list of all the permit holders for all of the fields within a borough. Uh, we assign either supervisors in the, the maintenance and operations supervisors or other staff within the operations chain of command or PEP to do spot checks of those permit holders to make sure that they are complying with their permit terms, they have their permit present, the right team is using the field at the right time, uh, and now uh, because of Local Law 57, that they have a, an AED and a certified operator present during Little League baseball games. What were the number of spot checks that were done last year? Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head. But that, okay. Uh, what was it in previous years? I don't have that information with me, Council Member. We will be happy to provide it to you. I hope that you would. That would be essential uh, for this type of a hearing to outline the checks and balances that we have. Now, I understand that we don't have enough PEP offices to meet the needs of the city to begin with, let alone supervisors and uh, whatnot that were understaffed. This is a big city uh, with many um, parks, including the Borough of the Bronx, which has the largest park in the city. Yes. Uh, and we are often um, understaffed. So it's very difficult for me to believe that we're doing proper spot checks when I can't get law, I can't get the proper enforcement of our parks, let alone the diversion to athletic fields when we've got serious crimes that are, that are being reported, everything from illegal barbecues and um, detriment to community and parkland the like. Uh, you're, you're help me understand what it would take for us to be done this, to have this done correctly to make sure that everyone has a fair opportunity. Well, as with many of the other activities that the Parks Department performs, uh, this is very seasonal in nature. And before, you know, busier activities occur, the beaches open, the pools open, people start barbecuing more frequently in the parks, mm -hmm. we have windows in which we can strategically direct our staff to do the kind of oversight we're discussing. Our ball field permits for the spring season become active in March, uh, and they run through uh, the end of August. That period between March and in the middle of May, we have a little bit more flexibility with our staff to do the kind of oversight we're discussing. And the truth of the matter is, after May, the use of baseball fields tends to decline pretty significantly once school gets out. And during the summer, uh, the, you know, the, the, the level of use is lower than it is during the spring. So we do have windows of opportunity where we can provide more focus. But yes, you're right. Over the course of a full year, we're not going to be in a position where we can be out there as regularly as we would like, ensuring compliance with our permits. A similar situation occurs in the fall uh, when permits become active. It's after the busy summer season. We have a little bit more time during that period in which we can focus some of those resources on compliance with our permits. But there again, uh, it's not uh, unlimited and we cannot visit every uh, field and every team as, as, likely, as often as we would like. Is there a waiting list of teams that have applied uh, for fields? Uh, I, I wouldn't call it a waiting list, but yes, there are, there are teams and leagues that cannot 
uh, that, that are not given permit time for the field that they requested. We always offer them an alternative uh, where we can. Uh, many teams and leagues accept that. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, the, the, the alternative field may not be convenient for them, um, and they don't accept what we offer. Uh, they can reapply. They can apply for other fields, but we don't keep a formal waiting list. So for transparency's sake, what is that number of teams or leagues that were denied or could not be given pr a proper accommodation? Uh, well, we, we were able to provide uh, a field, uh, either the requested field or an alternative, to 76% of the applicants that we received last year. So 24% were, were not, um, in terms of what the, the number was, it was 20, 26, uh, 2,600 applicants were not able to receive uh, a permit for the field and the time they requested. <coughs> 80, two, over 8,200 did receive a permit, either for the time and field they requested or an alternative that they were able to use. So roughly a quarter of the applicants will not have an opportunity to enjoy the fields of New York City? In many cases, there are fields available, and they may not be convenient to the yeah, applicant. OK. I come from the borough of the Bronx. Sending me to Brooklyn is not acceptable. I got it. No, sending So the, the facts are the numbers are the numbers. Tw a quarter of applicants will not be afforded an opportunity to use fields in New York City. Yes. That's the tragedy, and that has to be reversed. And if we have unscrupulous uh, or questionable uh, leagues and uh, teams that are using this high demand and supply is not there to meet the demand, then we're calling on you and the agency, the department, to weed out those individuals to make sure that every field is used to its maximum possibility. We agree, Council Member. Thank you, Councilman. Joe and I, uh, under 30 seconds. Under 30 seconds. <laughs> we'll give you a Bronx cheer. Um, we've also been joined now by uh, Councilman Costa Constantinese. We're going to get to you in a second. Give him a few seconds to uh, get his thoughts together. I have a few more questions, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, if multiple groups apply for permits uh, for the same space at the same time, which I imagine happens a lot, uh, how does Parks determine who should receive the permit? Is it based on seniority or somebody's been there or? Uh, the first criteria is whether it's a youth league or an adult league. Obviously, youth receive priority. Uh, within that, uh, returning uh, permit holders, that is, that is permit holders who received the, that field and that time the prior year and who uh, you know, fulfilled all of their obligations as a permit holder would get preference. Though our rules do allow us to consider new applicants uh, who have never uh, you know, held a permit for that time and field before. Uh, but that's the way we prioritize our field allocations. Do you have an estimate on how many fields are taken by the same group year after year, or how many are, would we say, I call them returnees? Um, I don't think we have that information with us, but we can probably deduce it from the I would appreciate if you could get database. that, um, at least a, you know, uh, an estimate, a good guess. Because I would assume most of the, I mean, leagues come and leave. I know that in my part of the world, little leagues are starting to combine with each other. Um, we have a, a large private complex in Eastern Queens, a pad of Amprella fields, where a bunch of uh, baseball fields come together. Um, Councilman Moore, you had a quick follow-up? I, I just have a quick follow-up. Can, can you just get me some information about what, um, whether you investigated and find, found out anything about the Parks of the Americas? We referred it to DOI. Um, you know, we, we are not an investigative or a agency. We referred it to the Department of Investigation. Um, I don't know what they concluded yet, um, and sometimes they don't tell us uh, for good reasons, uh, but we did refer it to them. Okay, and has there been spot checks done at that particular um, park since then? It is definitely on our list to be spot checked um, because it is a, a youth league uh, facility and they are required to have AEDs. I can't say when it was done, but it should have been done uh, this spring. 
can can you? I can look at that. And I'll let you know. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilman Moyer. Um, how often does it happen that somebody gets a permit and then they don't use it? Do you have a percentage basis for that, or I'm sure it's greatly troubling to you because we have such a limited amount of space for the number of people who want to play. I, I don't think we have that information as to. Oh. Uh, when we do know how many permit applications were withdrawn, uh, oh. but that's more a function of, um, you know, it, it is so easy to apply for a permit now. Uh, you can do it online. If you're a returning customer, uh, you know, your information auto-populates. Uh, we think that many people apply for lots of time and lots of fields that they are unable to use just to see if they can get uh, access to a preferred location or a preferred time slot. Uh, so we've seen over 2,400 applicants withdraw. Um, perhaps they, you know they've received what they really wanted, or as much as they could possibly use. Um, but uh, in terms of actually issuing a permit and having a league not use it, um, that I don't have that information here. Is there a limit on the number of permits a a league can have? Yes, there is a limit to the amount of. Uh, uh, the percentage of time a league can use at an individual facility unless it's a very large facility where we have more than 10 fields. Uh, but I think you're limited to 32 hours a week of play. And what about individuals um, who might be applying? Is there a limit to how much time they could get also? Uh, not an individual, no. If, if they're spread out over multiple fields uh, and they are not exceeding the limit that we place on you know, uh, the allocation an individual league can receive at the field, no, they can apply. So if, if Citizen Gredenchik, say, wanted to apply, he, uh, he or she could apply, in theory, all over the city, and I, I guess you might trip them up to some extent, but then again, you might not, because it, that does concern me. If, if somebody is not limited to the amount of s space they could take, they might see an opportunity there, um, the less... Uh, reasonable among us, they might see an opportunity there to um, do what we talked about before. And, yeah. Um, it takes a lot of work to organize a league and yeah, to I field know that. teams and, uh, you know, to just to, if someone was trying to just monopolize time without using it, uh, we would know that pretty quickly. But it does take less time to maybe try in an underhanded way to sell a permit that they, they didn't really qualify for in the first, or shouldn't have had in the first place. And I know you don't ha you're not an investigative agency, and I appreciate that, but um, it does concern me, and, and we may take a look at that, Mr. Council. Um, at this time, uh, Councilman Constantinides, please give him a minute because he's from Queens. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chair Gunanchik, I thank. <laughs> uh, it's good to see you, Deputy Commissioner. How are you? Uh, just I have a few questions. Uh, is preference given uh, on, a geo on a geographic basis? So youth leagues from the community uh, would have preference over youth leagues from other parts of the city, or, or how would that work? Uh, there is no geographic preference in our rules, uh, though typically, especially when it comes to youth leagues, uh, they receive you know, the, the most convenient location that we can provide. Okay, so there's nothing... There's nothing, no hard and fast rule there that, that's saying we're not going to send uh, kids to you know, a different part of a borough, even a different borough, um, when it comes to these types of, of, of leagues, right? No, there is not. Should there be? <laughs> it's a tough question. Uh, you know, our fields are not equitably, equitably distributed according to either community board lines mm -hmm. or council lines. And you know, to limit applicants to uh, a geographic area you know, may be just as unfair as, uh, as what you suggest, uh, you know, forcing kids to go to uh, travel extreme distances in order to play. I guess the other question I have is, so we're looking at a new field potentially uh, in Astoria with the Anchor Park project coming up. Yes. Um, so how will that work? Because I know we have several youth soccer leagues that are uh, very enthusiastic uh, about the, the, the opportunity to play. Um, there's also a, a community that's very uh, enthusiastic about the opportunity to play. How, we, how do we sort of envision 
a new field coming online and, and what would be the order of preference? How, you know, how would we make sure there's still time for free play and for the actual community to get onto the field and, and, and utilize it? So how do we sort of balance all these things as we're starting from scratch? Those are good questions, Council Member. <laughs> no, they, they, this would present a, a unique opportunity for us, uh, and we would want to take into all those thing, all those factors into consideration. Clearly, first of course, uh, you know, bona fide youth leagues would get preference for uh, what we consider the prime playing time, uh, which is usually three to seven on weekdays and eight to six mm. on weekends. Uh, but we do try to accommodate. Um, local unstructured play or free play uh, in some time. And there are fields, and it's permitted in our rules, where we do not permit certain periods of time in order to allow that to occur. Uh, so I'm not saying that this would be the case, uh, but I, I could envision at Astoria where Sunday afternoons we would not formally permit the field for organized sports to allow uh, you know, the local community, whether youth or adults, for pickup games. Many of our fields, uh, they're large enough to support informal game, more than one informal game at a time, and people use them in that way to let more people have access in a short period of time. So after we you know, consider youth and local youth leagues, and we would try to be as fair as we could in apportioning time among uh, applicants that fall into that category, uh, I think we would be open to considering what suits the community best in terms of other permitted or non-permitted play. So the other questions I have then are, you know, looking at um, uh, th someone that maybe has preference, right? You talked about sometimes there are fields that, that we have someone that, a returnee, as, as the chair talked about. Beyond the permit fees, do we require them to uh, pay any maintenance fees or anything that would uh, help the upkeep of the field for the long term? Are we just collecting the uh, the field. We make those types of agreements. Or is that something that we have in our in our toolbox to make sure we can keep the field viable uh, in the long term? We don't charge uh, any additional fees beyond the stated, uh, you know, ball field permit fees for adult leagues. Um, uh, the only instance that I know of uh, where we have agreements with leagues, uh, and they tend to be little leagues. We have what we, what we call maintenance agreements, whereby the league agrees. Uh, to maintain a field up to a certain standard. Uh, they don't get exclusive use of the field. Uh, mm -hmm. They do have to allow other uh, eligible permittees to use the field uh, during certain blocks of time, uh, but they do get the majority of the playing time at those fields. Okay, but there are, okay, so I'm just trying to get a sense yes. again. I'm, I'm trying to piece this together as we sort of have this new field coming online, uh, wanting to see the field in Astoria. Um, uh, go well, mm -hmm. uh, as, as uh, conflict-free as possible. I want to make sure that all of the leagues that want to play, especially the youth leagues, that we have like 300 kids who are very ch you know, chomping at the bit to get onto that field as soon as it's constructed, but also making sure there's a community, that there's, you know, they have good maintenance in place, and mm -hmm. we have uh, opportunities for free play and opportunities for, for this field to stay intact for you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, you know, that we're not having to go and redo the field in five years because it's so, mm -hmm. so, yes. so well used. No, we, we completely agree. Uh, I will make a shameless plug. Uh, we've developed a new synthetic turf maintenance crew that is doing really terrific work. It's allowing us to maintain the fields at a high level and to extend their useful life. And we will be using that crew at Astoria when the field is built. I, if the chair will indulge me, one more question. <laughs> How about fields that have been utilized for a long time? Um, it, what do we do um, to make sure that we can live up to our obligations? I know we've had some issues at St. Michael's Field in Astoria where the goalposts were not in good condition and we had permit holders that were sort of, uh, had some sort of consistent complaints about the, the sort of shape of the goalposts and, and, and the condition that they were in. How do we make sure that once we're leasing the fields out that they're in good condition to ensure that they can actually go ahead and play? Uh, we inspect the fields on a regular basis, and if there is a condition with an element like the goalpost, uh, we should be picking it up, and we should be taking corrective action. All right, great. I, mean, I definitely want to, uh, I think it was fixed, but I want to make sure that in the future that it doesn't take as many emails as it took in order to get it fixed yes. uh, next time around. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Constantinides. Um, 
revenue. I know it's we're not. This is not a, a money maker for uh, as far, you know for the city, but just curious, how much money do we get in permit fees? Uh, I don't have the number here. Uh, it all goes to the general fund. As right, as I you understand know. We that. Don't, we don't retain any of the revenue, but uh, we can calculate the, the, the amount we contribute. I'd just to be the curious. General. I know when it comes to fee collection, we're only supposed to, it's not a fee, not a tax, or right. a, it's not a money maker for no, the city, and unless somebody's shooting a movie or something like that, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, but we wouldn't know if the fee, I, has the amount collected gone up or down, or we just, in recent years, we just. Uh, it has it has gone up. One we did increase the, you know, the, the price of a permit uh, a, a couple of years ago when we did when we redid the, our rules, and there has been some growth uh, in the adult category. Most of the most of the growth has occurred in youth sports, but we have seen some growth in, in adults of sports as well. Okay. And we are obviously you've made it clear you try to accommodate everybody in the room. Councilman Joe Nice, um, line of questioning, we kind of have an idea of how many people get fields as opposed to the number of people who are disappointed. Um, I'll ask this question. What is the number of athletic fields that are typically reserved for permitted activity compared to fields um, that are available for open and non-permitted uses open to the general public? So do you have baseball fields that are kind of left on the side just in case somebody wants to have a pickup game or – do you tend to permit everything that you can, issue permits for everything that you can during the, the heavy season? Uh, rather than um, not permit a field, we, we would allow certain days or time periods to be, to be unpermitted to allow for local play. So it, we would not you know, completely exclude a field from potentially being permitted for some activity, uh, but we carve out time uh, for informal play. I know, like, when I drove by the soccer fields this morning at Cunningham Park, they were not being used because it was, it was early in the morning. Perfectly yes. good time, a little chilly yeah. this morning, but it's hard. We, you know, it, it's, uh, they're very heavily used in the afternoon, um, greatly so, uh, which I, always makes me feel good. I love to see mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of mostly children running around. No, if you're able to play uh, on a weekday uh, during school year, uh, you before three o'clock, you can almost have your pick. Uh, that's true. Fields. Yeah, that's uh, that's okay though. I mean, it, it's a great credit to the city that we we allow these uses and we have them when uh, the fields are not being used. But I guess it's also good for the field. The grass gets to grow; it it needs to rest as well. Yes, uh, natural turf fields actually need more rest than we're able to provide. I know. During, during the during the active we're trying out season. there. We're, we're watering trying. those fields. Yes. Um, can you describe the permitting process? Uh, for groups of fewer than 20 per participants, is there a difference for smaller groups? Uh, well, um, there is a, a completely different process for applying for and receiving a special event permit. Okay. Uh, and a group that is less than 20% does not, 20 persons rather, does not need a special event permit. However, if you want to reserve a specific place to hold your event, even if you're less than 20, uh, you, you should get a permit to make sure that that spot is available for you uh, when you want to hold your event. Are there, I guess there are certain sections of parks that are just not permitted that, you know, we, we wouldn't have people playing sports there at any time that people want to come, they want to put the chair out and read a newspaper or something like that. Um, is that. Is there information on your website where there are places like that for a small event like this? Set up a volleyball game or something like that? Well, we, we have volleyball courts, uh, official volleyball courts, where we do issue permits for people to play, and they can play on them informally if there is no active permit. Uh, but we also have identified event locations around the city that are separate and apart from ball fields and courts uh, where people can hold you know, a variety of events um, depending on you know, what they're, where they want to be and what type of event they want to hold. Uh, you know, certainly events that are structured around barbecuing or picnicking take place in, in specific areas, um, you know, gatherings of, of, of groups depending on the size. We, we have a wide range of spaces that we can offer and we have, you know, clearly identified what those spaces are and are able to, you know, to share them with people. And of course, many people, you know, especially 
you know, parents with young children, they want to have a, a, a birthday party in a playground, and we can often accommodate that. Uh, so there's a wide range of places. It's gotten there. pretty sophisticated because I guess it was last year, not this year, but I was in Cunningham Park. They have the name taped on, oh, you yeah. know. It's pretty, it, that's pretty good um, to see that. Um, is there any difference in the permitting process, say, in Staten Island than you would have in the Bronx or Queens or is there... It's, is it a uniform process? I guess that's what I'm getting at. It's a uniform process, and the same rules apply in every borough. Okay. And um, is there a process that you have to determine um, what spaces would be used for, uh, would be held for groups as opposed to that might be, it's kind of like a follow-up to what I asked before, um, what space would be held for organized uh, little leagues or adult groups as opposed to you know, 20 people that decide that on the first Saturday of the month they want to play a game, you know, guys getting together, women getting together uh, for that. Is there – it's harder, I know. I know it you is. don't like to leave fields open just for we, maybe. No, uh, for, you know, for maybe. But we do have a, a category in our permit rules for, uh, you know, for uh, special it, – it's not called special event applicants, but it's different from our seasonal applicants, people who want to play a season's worth of sports. Uh, it's limited. It's for tournaments and it's for events like you describe uh, a reunion where they want to have a, a softball game as part of their festivities. Uh, we do allow that. Um, sometimes it's actually easier to find you know one small block of time at a field that a group of adults can access uh, than it is to provide a league with a season's worth of playing time at, at a specific field or group of fields. All right, um, I'm done. Anything else, Councilman? Oh, yes, I guess that's a yes. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing uh, the borough of the Bronx has the largest park, therefore we get a second round okay. for the chair. Um, of the 1,000 athletic fields, what is the breakdown borough-wide, by borough? Um, so in total number of fields and courts that this is, and courts are by far the largest number, there are 1,800 in Brooklyn, 1,000 in Manhattan, 1,800 in Queens, 244 in uh, Staten Island, and 983 in the Bronx. Uh, just athletic fields. Athletic fields. Uh, it's broken down a little bit, so it may be a little bit harder. But in base, uh, I'm sorry, uh, baseball, there are 50 in Brooklyn, 26 in Manhattan, 52 in Queens, 8 in Staten Island, 34 in the Bronx. Uh, cricket, 11 in Brooklyn, none in Manhattan, 26 in Queens, one in Staten Island, 16 in the Bronx. Football, there are 34 in Brooklyn, eight in Manhattan, 16 in Queens, eight in Staten Island, eight in uh, the Bronx. Um, the next one, big one, is soccer. 73 in Brooklyn, 74 in Manhattan, 49 in Queens, nine in Staten Island, 35, 35 in the Bronx. And in softball, it's 150 in Brooklyn and 124 in Manhattan, 204 in Queens, 39 in Staten Island, and 95 in the Bronx. You know, besides, I guess there's a added benefit to living in Brooklyn, uh, although the, the Bronx seems to have much more parkland, we certainly don't have the equivalent in fields. And the number of soccer fields in the borough of the Bronx was 35, is that correct? Yes. To Brooklyn, 73, to Queens, 74. Manhattan has 74, including Randall's Island, mm -hmm. which is a citywide facility. Right. Randall's Island, I was looking at the other day, just a map, because um, I want to visit there, but it seemed like Randall's Island has an enormous amount of playing fields. Mm -hmm. Randall's Island does have the largest concentration of playing fields in the city. Um, so it's a great story. It was developed by the Randall's Island Park Association. Close to the Bronx. It's a citywide resource. It's heavily used by teams from the Bronx as well as from Queens and Manhattan. Uh, and you know, I do have to point out that yes, the Bronx has a lot more parkland. Uh, Brooklyn has a lot more people. Well, understandable. But you know, the way we get more people to the borough of the Bronx is by giving them more options, and this may not be a bad one. But what now using those same numbers? Uh, and I like math and. Yes where math one and one equals two, and not that fuzzy math that's sometimes used, of the 24% or a quarter of applicants that are denied, what is the breakdown by borough? Okay. 
I, I can't do the percentage in my head, uh, but, it, uh, but there were 1,100 approved applicants in the Bronx and 292 uh, were denied out of 1,563. That's a quarter. People. So mm -hmm. it's roughly the same as the city wide. More than a quarter. It's more a little quarter. higher. A little more than a quarter. Yeah. About 30%, right? Depends on what you use as a denominator. Somewhere between more than a quarter, less than a third. Uh, continue, please, what, um, for the rest of the boroughs? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't have the percentages, but for example, yeah. in terms of the total number of, uh, of applications denied, Manhattan by far had the highest, 1,531. I think it's a function of a small number of fields and a larger demand because of uh, corporations that want to play there, and the public schools of Manhattan don't have their own fields as they have in other boroughs, so mm -hmm. it creates more demand. Uh, in Brooklyn, there were 558 denials. Uh, in Queens, it was only 169. And in Staten Island, there were 52. Okay. So because you brought up an interesting fact that Brooklyn has more people, therefore more fields, uh, just looking at the number, uh, with the exception of Manhattan, which has vari variables uh, as to why there's such a high demand, the borough of the Bronx by far exceeds the number of denied permits than any other borough percentage per capita. So based on the 1 million, 1.4 million residents of the great borough of the Bronx, we have a much higher denial rate on requests for fields. Although we have the largest number, the largest acreage of parkland in the entire city. And you can see a tremendous disadvantage for Bronx sites on their request for use of athletic fields compared to the rest of the city. And I want to make that a point. Largest park, largest denial, and per capita. So we need to do more to increase the number of playing fields that we have just basically simply on demand per capita. The Bronx should get its fair share. I'm with you on that. Uh, I want to thank you, Commissioner, for being here today um, and for answering um, the questions I do have. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, I would ask, as was requested by Councilman Moyer before, that uh, somebody be uh, left here, not left yes. here, but somebody be stationed here uh, until the testimonies are, are completed. I'm going to call the first panel. Uh, to follow the commissioner, uh, Mr. Esteban Peralta, or is it Peralta? I figured it was, per I should have gone with Peralta. Uh, Raymond Chung and Yuman Peng. So that'll be the first panel. Gonna leave your laptop there, or I just—is that your laptop? Oh, it's ours. Okay, even better. I'm gonna ask that the uh, clerk set uh, the sergeant at arms set the clock uh, for three minutes. And Mr. Peralta, please begin. Three minutes. Okay. Uh, but I need somebody in Spanish. That's okay. Si, si puedes. Okay. Uh, yo soy el representante del Club Hermanos Unidos de Queens uh, y la queja de nosotros es que tenemos permiso a, hasta agosto 26, los sábados, y septiembre primero, los domingos. Cuando necesitamos la extensión, nos topamos que ya alguien... Eh, ...tiene la extensión. Y esa persona que coge la extensión todos los años, tenemos que pagarle 300 dólares por el sábado, 300 dólares por el domingo para nosotros poder jugar. Yo escuché que él dijo, el comisionado que estaba aquí, que eso era ilegal. Pero en Queen nunca se ha supervisado eso. Aparte de eso, tenemos el problema de los niños en el parque de la 104. Que la, per la persona que más permiso tiene ahí. So let me stop you right okay. there so I can do a quick translation. Okay. 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 So what uh, Mr. Peralta is saying that he represents uh, uh, the 
club, Hermanos Unidos, uh, in Corona, Queens. Um, he's specifically uh, citing examples of when uh, his um, baseball league has gone, f uh, their permits have gone to the end of August, and they've needed extensions to go into, sub in, into September because of the playoffs that they, that they have played. Um, they have uh, paid uh, upwards of $300 um, for the permits from other leagues to utilize the baseball fields to be extended into that time. Uh, and then he was talking about uh, the children's leagues uh, that he's seeing the same uh, problems that he's facing. So, continue. Bueno, con la Liga de los Niños en el Parque de la 104 y la 41 Avenida, ese Hinton Park, yo creo, ahí nos topamos con que una sola persona tiene todos los permisos. Y si necesitamos jugar con los niños, no podemos o tenemos que darle... 250 dollars para nosotros poder jugar. Hold on right there. So he's saying that in Hinton Park, um, where it's all uh, for children's leagues that are there, there's only one uh, permit holder uh, for those leagues. Um, and the, if they want to do anything with their um, children's baseball leagues, they have to go to that particular individual uh, and pay upwards to $200 um, to get the permit to utilize uh, the baseball field there. No han pasado los tres minutos, qué bueno. Entonces, eh, nos hemos topado con que esa persona también se asocia con alguna liga de niños para poder operar en ese parque. O sea, ahí hay una liga que se llama La Javilla, que él se asoció con esa persona para los beneficios eh, coger entre, los, entre las dos personas. So he, uh, the permit holder, also uh, associates himself with another league called La Javilla, and they uh, then uh, utilize the space under uh, the permits uh, under his league and this particular league uh, to uh, hold all of the permits in the areas. And if they want to go to any one of, uh, they have to go to either one of them to get the permits. Y nosotros necesitamos que esos permisos sean distribuidos entre las ligas de niños que están por ahí. Nosotros como Hermanos Unidos tuvimos que suspender eh, nuestro torneo de niños porque no teníamos dónde jugar. So he's talking about uh, the distribution of equity, um, that it should be a fair process, that uh, they had to suspend their um, children's uh, baseball league because of the fact that there was no availability for permits and that, you know, obviously they have to pay uh, in order to get these permits, and he just wants to see a fair process. Muchas gracias. Yo espero que el comisionado tome carta en el asunto y mande los supervisores a ver quiénes juegan, quiénes tienen permiso, porque nosotros, los Hermanos Unidos, estamos sufriendo de este problema en Corona, Queens. Uh, he wants uh, uh, to uh, thank uh, the deputy commissioner, the chair, um, and ask that uh, they please look into uh, the issue of what is going on in Corona, uh, in particular with these leagues, so that uh, there can be a more uh, fair and equitable balance in terms of um, how these uh, permits are being issued, uh, and in to ensure that these uh, kids can uh, have a, a, an opportunity to uh, play in these leagues. Thank you for your testimony. Muchas gracias, Senor Peralta. Mr. Chang. Uh, hi, hello. Hello, hello. That's it. Okay. <laughs> hi, uh, my name is Raymond Chan. Uh, I'm from Chinatown Athletic Council. Uh, we have been in the community for more than 20 years, and we help other non-profit organizations for many events, different events, such as uh, uh, London New Year, Chinatown, Parade, uh, Moon Festival uh, event, and also Moon Circle, Moon Festival event. Uh, we send our our team members to help the community to create a better time and time. And but uh, and also we help a lot. Um, uh, kid, we want a lot of soccer program uh, in Chinatown uh, for kids, uh, young adults, uh, and also uh, we welcome everybody to join us because uh, it's pretty sad that everyone had to, you know, for local people had to sit 
outside and watch other people to play soccer because um, you know you have to pay a lot of money to get into those leagues. Um, so that's why anyway we got our uh, permit uh, permit from usually from uh, Friday and Sunday uh, afternoon each day we have about four hours. Um, then then we are at uh, Roosevelt uh, Lion Gate Playground on Grand Street and Chris Christie Street. Um, now we have the permit. We 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 some up, some I think some outsider uh, took away our time uh, for you know some deep, and uh, it's not fair for us to uh, and, and just watch them to play soccer. Uh, I hope you could um, reconsider a group and uh, submit. Uh, I mean, let us to use the field uh, in the future. Uh, we have one of our parents here. Uh, to speak about our programs. Um, th thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, um, yes, my I have two little kids, five and seven. We've been doing the program for over two years. It's actually the highlight of our summer because it's not just about soccer. It, I mean, it's great for community, like he said. Um, it's free. It's for the community, and a lot of a lot of these kids cannot afford to go to summer so soccer programs. So it really helps community. The, the, the actual field is on Christie and Grand. It's in the, pretty much the middle of Chinatown. I mean, every all the community, all the store owners, everyone's Chin Chinese in that community. I've, I mean, I have grew up in this community all my life, and and uh, it provides my kids a way of basically play, uh, playing soccer. And not just that, a lot of, uh, well, all the uh, volunteers are actually a lot of seniors, and they devote their time, and they also do like, a lot of like, if they say, if you if you can't do it on Sunday, I'll I'll I'll, I'll come in on Tuesday. I'll just you know bring you know they just went to volunteer to give their time. And it's not just soccer; they also teach Chinese. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like on the side because they, they speak in the, in our native tongue, which is not really spoken as much. We're we're not this, you know we speak I speak Cantonese, which is a everyone speaking Mandarin now, and it just brings us back to the. To, to the community, and I feel like uh, we, we lost this permit, but like you said, we're doing this for 20 years, and it, it is a community thing. You you had a permit and you lost it, or? I, yeah, I, I have the permit seen, um, uh, that great pay, pay just open, and we used to have two days, and after two years, they took away our Friday night, because more people coming down from other uh, borough, uh, maybe uptime, midtime from other borough, anyway, uh, now we only have Sunday afternoon since last year, um, and then we lost it, you know, since sin last year. Were you given a reason why you lost it? They say that we have um, adult pain in our field. We're getting our youth uh, permit, but however, you know, we, we had, like, like I told you before, we had our programs in 20 years, and we were, we were as 15, 16 years old back then. And now everyone going up, you know, to Ghana Dow, and and they also want to give away. I mean, give back to the community, and they all come out and help our youth program as a coach, and as a return. And I, um, I want to give them some time to play soccer. Like I say, everyone have to pay. You know, you know, from three. I mean, from six to nine every Sunday afternoon. Everyone, you know, from other league, they have to pay out. I mean, you have to pay uh, Hiwama maybe a thousand to two thousand dollars to join a team, to join the league, and us is free, and that's why I think they talk it away. They say I have, I have a doubt to pay up with my time spot. Councilman Moyer, you had a question. Uh, yeah. Um, so one, let me just uh, thank you uh, for coming here and taking the time out of your uh, busy schedule to. Uh, testify here today. Uh, I think that uh, this is very helpful for us um, to really um, start focusing a little bit more on uh, what is happening and shed some light um, on this permitting process. Uh, just a quick question, uh, and I'm going to say it in Spanish and I'll translate um, back into English. Uh, Señor Peralta, it, cuando usted dice que ha habido eh, este tipo de abuso de, de permisos es específicamente en estos uh, en estas ligas de, de, de béisbol en Corona 
¿Esto es un, un, un problema que usted ve recientemente o ya por mucho tiempo, muchos años que se ha visto este problema y, y, y sigue uh, empeorándose eh, eh, con, viendo la, la popularidad del deporte que, que tenemos en nuestra comunidad? Eso tiene muchos años pasando. Ahora tenemos eh, que el Parque de la 114 eh, lo están rentando en el día para los niños que, que practican fútbol. Uh -huh. eh, el mismo problema tenemos en el Parque de la 104. O sea, es un problema viejo. Soy la misma persona. So, I asked the question is um, if this problem that he sees uh, in the baseball fields in Corona Is this a recent problem? Is this a, a, a long-term problem? Uh, has it gotten worse uh, since the, both the baseball and soccer are, are the biggest played sports in, in the community? Uh, his response was that uh, it's been uh, an ongoing problem and it continues to get worse. He, he cited another example of the park on uh, 114th Street. Um, where during the day, uh, during the day games, they, they rent it out, and it's and again, it's for kids leagues, uh, which makes it uh, more difficult for people to um, get to uh, utilize the uh, park um, for their leagues. Okay, gracias. Thank you. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for testifying today. I appreciate that you're taking your time uh, to make the process fairer. And we greatly appreciate your being here today. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you. Um, the next panel, Isaac Daniel Astrachan. Did I get that right, I hope? Close, Close enough yeah. for government work? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Paul Fox and Sarah Hill. Brad, I haven't forgotten about you, Brad. If we were in the chamber, I'd get four of you up there, but I think it'd be a little tight. So we'll try the first three, and then, Brad, you'll have your own panel. All right. Um, whoever would like to begin? Ladies first. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sarah Hill, and I represent Five Star Soccer Academy. It's a nonprofit um, youth training program that my husband and I have started last year. And I'm here to testify to kind of share my experience of obtaining some fields for the kids to play. In the uh, colder weather, we, we use the city uh, public schools. To Which borough are you in? In Queens, Queens um, okay. primarily in Long Island City and Astoria. Um, so in the winter, we use the city schools, um, the public schools, to use the in for indoor. And in the summer, it's been very difficult to obtain fields. And a lot of times, what my husband has done is just kind of you know figure out what field is not being used, and then arrive about an hour and a half early to set up and. Um, for the most part, people don't don't show. So it's worked, but it's not the ideal scenario as we want to be able to grow our academy, um, but we can't if we don't know where exactly we're going to be. Uh, primarily on Wednesdays, we use Queensbridge Park, um, and we've really had some issues with figuring out when it's available. We have emailed, we have, you know, every, on the day when it's open, we have submitted a permit, um, and it's always been denied. They give us, they re, you know, when we, um, Put, our, put in our application, which is a very easy process. Um, they respond either with a withdrawal or declined. Um, and then some t lately they've given us a couple handful of days. And we've asked, you know, when we are first giving up our um, scheduling our, our season, we can be flexible with the times. And so we've asked many times, you know, what are the times that are available? Um, and we've never been given a response. So, you know, we have a permit for a handful of days um, for you know, for about a month, but that's it. Um, however, we're still using the field because no one's there. So I wanted to testify to share my experience that, you know, the fields are still not being used. Um, it's unclear who are the permit holders because, you know, we wanted to reach out to make sure that it was okay for us to come or they weren't gonna show up. Um, so it's still, you know, there's still that, that issue. And it was also very unclear who to go to to report this. Um, I'm glad I came today because now I, I understand. That's the first deputy commissioner right there. <laughs> yes. Um, so now I know who to, to call, but it's still very unclear on the system. Um, you know, you mentioned that there was reports, but I don't know where to access this. And, um, and again, it's very unclear who are the permit holders. And I hope that that, that um, 
becomes more of a fair process as we're a new academy and, and our mission's very um, honorable. My husband really wants to bring more soccer at a very affordable rate. We only charge $50 a month for our kids to train. Um, and it's just still very hard to grow his academy without um, really having a place, a field that we can call our, our own. I appreciate your testimony. I would appreciate if you could send, uh, after we're done here today, um, the council to the committee your information when you found fields empty and uh, you know, the com first deputy commissioner is here as well as some of the staff from Parks. So I would appreciate if you would share with them so they could look into that as well. And just to, who am I sharing this with? I mean, I, am I giving you, I'm this just taking is, down your contact information? Yeah, yes. Thank you. All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. It's been very enlightening hearing uh, everyone's testimony. Um, I'm a board member of Downtown United Soccer. Uh, since 1982, we've operated on the west side of Manhattan, mostly at Pier 40. And uh, we have 4,000 uh, players in our league. Uh, recently, we have uh, noticed that there is um, not a soccer presence on the Lower East Side. And uh, just to give you a comparison, th uh, three years ago we started um, a free program at the Henry Street Settlement. We now have 170 kids that we're providing free soccer for. And we want to expand uh, into a rec league on, uh, into Lindsay Park on the Lower East Side. Um, as far as we can tell, there are about 500 kids in soccer programs on the Lower East Side. If you look at the 4,000 I have on the west side and the demographics on the east side, you should have 8,000 kids playing soccer. Um, we're not that special at what we do. We roll the ball out like everybody else and the parents are involved. Um, so you should definitely have that number. I went to the parks department. We're relatively familiar with the permitting process. We go through it every year. And uh, we were told that uh, there are no available permits and that they are all be given to the uh, existing holders. Uh, that being said, I then started along the path of contacting each of the council members. Each of the council members referred me down to the local community board, which I'm happy to go through this process. I'm learning a lot along the way. Uh, presented to the community board and um, waiting to get on to the park subcommittee of the community board to fly my case. What I'm not seeing uh, in terms of transparency in the process is um, in, I can pull up on the website right now who has the spring permits, but I want the fall permits. And I've started this discussion so that we can get things organized and be ready. You can't see who has the fall permits or who had them last year. Every season they pull them down the, uh, the winter permits and they put up the spring permits. So my bad I didn't go and take a screenshot in the fall because I just didn't know it. But that's a minor point, but if we could have history, it would be helpful because I'm now gonna go to the community board and make the argument, hey, this is an adult league, hey, this is a for-profit league, hey, this is unused space, and we're gonna have a conversation. The next uh, mechanism that I'm unclear on is how exactly does that community board articulate the view of the community to the parks department that so that once I've been vetted by them and they believe me, how are we going to displace those people or is there no way because they hold the existing prof, uh, permit? Well, I, I think I got in just under you, you were perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that what well, you've heard today that youth organizations have um, priority in the city of New York. You heard that from uh, the first deputy commissioner. Every community board, I used to be in charge of the community boards in the borough of Queens, so I can tell you that every community board uh, have different processes. Um, you know, for instance, you know, when it comes to naming streets and street corners for uh, uh, various individuals who did great things for our city, some community boards don't act on them at all. Um, some act through their transportation committee, some act through their trans com transportation committee followed up by uh, the full committee. That's just three of my different community boards just to give you some idea of what happens. Um, so. Um, you may find that in one community board on the Lower East Side, it may be totally different on the community board on the West Side of Manhattan. Um, but that just develops over years and um, 
community boards have been around for closing in on 50 years now. So, um, but going through the community board is the right path. It, uh, well, you can apply directly. You know, you can talk to the local parks people. Well, we, we have. We started with that and we were rebuffed. We were told there were no permits available. And we are a known quantity to them. We hold permits all over the city. And we are also a youth soccer program. And so now we have to go through there. And I assume they're all held by not-for-profits and children-focused groups. Well, I guess you'll, you'll be able to see right now who holds them, at least for the spring. Right, but in the fall is what we're... Councilman Moyer? Um, just a quick point on, I think you brought up a really good point about seeing the history of who's actually um, getting those permits and whether or not they're for-profit, non-for-profit, are they running a youth league? And maybe that's something that uh, we can work with uh, the Parks Department uh, and the folks that are still here uh, on making sure that those lists do stay up so that we can have a history of who is utilizing those spaces. Um, I also want to commend uh, the Deputy Commissioner um, for staying here. Uh, a lot of times we uh, have the agencies come in and just the staff stays, uh, but I want to thank you uh, for staying here because this really is a very important uh, uh, hearing and uh, the fact that you remained um, is uh, a point that uh, is well taken here by, by myself and I think this committee as well. Certainly, thank you, Councilman Moyer. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name again. Astrakhan. Astrakhan. Yeah, Astrakhan. Okay. Um, I'm a resident of Battery Park City. Um, I'm an architect by day and a the vice president of Downtown United Soccer Club by night or vice versa these days. Um, <laughs> like Paul said, we serve a lot of kids with uh, various uh, different programs, recreational to an academy program, where when kids are training. Uh, multiple times a week, four or five times a week. So just to give you, th to go back to this notion of proximity, uh, from an example that I know well, my son, my son has a Wednesday practice, he lives in Battery Park City, has a Wednesday practice in uh, on Randall's Island, uh, he takes the subway, has a Thursday practice on Roosevelt, and a Friday practice at Columbia University, all the way up at Bakerfield. He's uh, well motivated. He's very, very motivated. Uh, but we have a lot of very, very motivated players who want to play and want to keep playing and want to play in college, and it's a big part of their lives. Um, and this problem is not going away. Um, as you all know, there's just not enough fields available. So if we can streamline the field permitting process, that would be already going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm t Manhattan is small. Uh, Randall's Island is a great facility. Um, you could look at it on Google Earth now. It's just unbelievable how many fields that we have there. Uh, the, the drawback to some extent is that it's not exactly, it's in the middle of the city, but it's not exactly um, in the middle of a, a populated area. You have to make an effort to get there, but uh, the fields are there. So I want to thank you uh, for helping us uh, to hear about these issues today. Thank you very much. I also want to thank you uh, for your work with the young people of New York City. Having been a Little League manager and coach over uh, several decades, I know um, how wonderful that can be and the feeling that you get in working with the young people. I also know how frustrating it can be at times as well, but that goes with, uh, I guess, just being human beings. So thank you for being here today. Um, we're gonna dismiss this panel and ask for Mr. Brad Taylor. Uh, if there's anyone else that wants to testify, please see the Sergeant at Arms. I also want to welcome uh, from the Great Borough of Brooklyn, Justin Brannan. Mr. Taylor, uh, you're with Friends of Morningside Park. Yes, so I, I'm not with a, with a league. Uh, we, we actually are a, a friends group, a parks advocacy group. And so we uh, actually try to stay away from taking permits out on the fields because we want the leagues to be able to do that. So I just had some very minor uh, suggestions, but I think that they could be helpful in all of this. Thank you. In terms of transparency. And, and that is, well, well I, I now realize that the permits, you can see the permits uh, online. They're not posted at, at the fields themselves, at least not, not where we are. And, and for a parks advocacy group, and we've got a board that lives right around the park, for us to be able to see a list at the field, you know, who's supposed to be on this field and who's not on this field. I mean, we're, we're in Manhattan, we get a lot 
of people wanting to use the fields, and frankly, there's a lot of unpermitted use. And if you looked at the schedule uh, online, you would say, wow, this, this field you know, does get a chance to rest because it's only you know, West Side Little League, X, XYZ, are using it on the weekends. But in fact, when you go out there, you see a, a, a tremendous amount of use. And if, if members of the public or parks advocates were able to see uh, which groups actually did have permits and which did not, we could actually help out and you know, call PEP directly or call 311. Uh, but that's, that's, by not having the list there at the fields, it's, it's a detriment to our trying to help out with this problem. You can probably access that information fairly quickly um, at the park's website, you know, um, with, a, with any kind of smartphone these days. Uh, I think it would be almost impossible, um, given the resources available to the parks department, to uh, track down every person that's using a field. Um, I, my, my community has a great number of almost 1,500 acres of parklands and dozens and dozens of um, baseball fields, lots of soccer fields, cricket. And so sometimes, you know, I know when it's an organized league because they're wearing you know, uniforms, and I know when it's not because you could just tell, um, but it would be impossible. And most of the time, at least in eastern Queens, uh, the fields aren't being used because nobody wants to play at 8 in the morning on a Monday because they have to work or they're in school or whatever. It's unusual. We do have pickup games. Um, the cops and the firefighters are there. They have uh, tournaments, but that's more unusual than not. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that uh, you, know, you, you need to have uh, every, but just having it uh, posted at the field, I think, is just a common sense thing to do, and I don't think it's that hard to do, at least not, not, not fr from where we are in, in Morningside Park. There's a bulletin board right there. Uh, why can't we have the, the permits posted at the field? I mean, it's not a bad idea. The first deputy commissioner has heard it, and I'm sure he'll take it uh, under advisement. Um, if you have anything else. No, that's it. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Going once, going twice, sold. Thank you all for being here today. With that, we close the hearing.